This video for qualitative data analysis is focused on coding. This is not intended to be a definitive video on coding, but provides some groundwork for this important element of qualitative data analysis. The information for this video is drawn primarily from three textbooks, the Coding Manual for Qualitative Researchers, Qualitative Data Analysis, a Method Sourcebook, and Qualitative Data Analysis with MVivo. Qualitative research can yield a rich contextual understanding of complex ideas or social processes. Qualitative data may include interviews, observations, documents, artifacts, or other text or visual data. Qualitative analysis is a reflective and iterative process which includes collecting data, assigning codes to data, looking for patterns, and using those patterns to inform additional data collection. Through this process, researchers can describe themes, theories, or concepts. In this video, I will contextualize coding, define a code, discuss first and second cycle coding, identify potential pitfalls, and highlight some of the many analytic decisions you will make as you begin coding your data. Before you begin coding, you should have collected data through interviews, observations, or gathering documents. Before coding, interviews need to be transcribed and field notes should be typed and organized. Data preparation is a key part of your analysis. Before you begin coding, read through all of the materials you've collected to become familiar with the full corpus of the data. Images and visual data can be coded, but for the purposes of this video, I'm focusing on text-based data. How you code your data will be reflective of your worldview, and it should be anchored in your methodology, conceptual framework, and research questions. The analytic decisions you make should be documented through memos to enhance the trustworthiness of your research. I will talk more about memos later in the video. In the past, students have been reluctant to begin coding for fear of getting it, quote, wrong. However, it may be helpful to consider that prior to coding your data, you have made a lot of decisions which have already begun the process of data condensation. These analytic decisions include developing a conceptual framework, selecting a methodology, drafting research questions, bounding your case, creating a data collection strategy, and choosing instrumentation, among other decisions. Miles, Huberman, and Saldana describe three elements of qualitative data analysis. Though often presented sequentially, data condensation, data display, and drawing and verifying conclusions take place concurrently. They define data condensation as selecting, focusing, simplifying, abstracting, and or transforming the data that appear in the full corpus of written up field notes, interview transcripts, documents, and other empirical materials. Coding is part of condensing data. There are multiple options for coding data, and the option you choose may vary based on timing, volume of data, availability of resources, comfort with different approaches, or your philosophical approach to coding. Whether you are coding by hand, using Microsoft Word, or using computer-assisted qualitative data analysis software, such as Invivo, the underlying principles for analysis are the same. It can be tempting to imagine that software will ease the burden of coding. Although tools that support analysis can help with organizing data and more easily manipulating coded data, the quality of the data and the analytic decisions are dependent upon the researcher as an instrument of the qualitative process. A code is a word or phrase that summarizes or assigns meaning to some portion of your text-based or visual data. Some people mistake coding as a step before analysis, but coding is analysis. The process of coding provides an opportunity to think deeply about your data and requires you to interpret the information. The reflection that goes along with assigning representative codes is a crucial step in understanding qualitative data. One way to think about coding is to imagine you are taking different pieces of the data and putting them into buckets. You might start with interview transcripts, survey responses, documents, or social media data. And as you read through the material, you're looking for segments of text that are salient, meaning they are connected to your conceptual framework or address your research questions. When you identify a segment of text and assign a code to that segment, and then identify another segment of text with the same code, you're essentially saying all of the pieces of information with this code belong together, and all of the pieces of information with a different code belong together in a different bucket. In this manner, you sort through your information and sift out the most salient pieces. In subsequent passes of coding and with further analysis, these codes can be refined into categories or themes. There are two primary approaches to coding, deductive and inductive. 
In deductive coding, you work from the top down. You begin with the list of codes you expect to see prior to going into the field and collecting data. These codes are drawn from the conceptual framework, research questions, or literature review. The authors describe this as provisional coding, where you begin with a priori codes or a start list of codes. These codes can be modified, deleted, expanded, or combined as analysis progresses. With inductive coding, you work from the bottom up. The codes are drawn from the data collection and the site rather than being determined before going into the field. Another consideration for coding is how much text gets coded at once. Codes are attached to segments or chunks of data, which can vary in length from one word to a full paragraph or page. Most often, the section of coded text will be somewhere in between. It should be long enough to give context and capture the full idea, but short enough that it doesn't contain extraneous information or multiple ideas that might be better coded separately. Lumping involves broad strokes, where you're coding perhaps a full paragraph or page and applying one code to a larger segment of text. With splitting, you're approaching the data in much smaller chunks. In a paragraph, you may have multiple codes. You may use both lumping and splitting, depending upon your approach to coding. One of the challenges people have shared is that when they begin coding, everything seems interesting and worth coding. One way you can manage the feeling that everything needs to be coded is to refer frequently to your conceptual framework or research questions. In particular, when you are taking an inductive approach to coding, the first item you code will significantly impact the development of your codes. When you begin coding, try to select an interview transcript or document that is representative of the body of your data and is not an outlier. Also remember that you can always go back and uncode something or code additional data or modify the coding structure based on new insight. As you analyze your data, you will likely go over the materials several times. First cycle coding is the initial pass through the data where you begin assigning codes to the text. In Saldana's coding manual for qualitative researchers, there are over 25 first cycle coding methods. It's important to note that you don't have to choose one type of coding. You may incorporate multiple approaches to the degree that it makes sense for your project. In Chapter 4 of Qualitative Data Analysis, Miles, Huberman, and Saldana present an abbreviated list of first cycle coding methods. I will briefly describe some of the approaches you may be most likely to use, and I encourage you to explore this chapter or Saldana's text for more detailed information on each of these approaches to coding. Descriptive coding is useful for indexing or categorizing. With descriptive coding, you assign a word, often a noun, to a passage. This is useful for field notes, and particularly ethnographic field notes, but may not be as useful for interviews. In vivo coding is one of the most well-known approaches to coding, and it works well for most qualitative studies. With this approach, you use the participant's own words to create the codes. This is useful to honor and prioritize the voice of the participants. The authors recommend using quotation marks to indicate coding in the words of the participants. Process coding uses gerunds, or words that end in ing, to focus on action. Process codes are able to highlight dynamics related to time, change, or sequences. Process codes work well for most studies, particularly grounded theory. Concept coding focuses on ideas rather than observable behaviors or objects. In the text, they give the example that going to a coffee shop every day goes beyond purchasing coffee, the observable action, and may better be coded as performing a daily ritual, developing a habit, or feeding an addiction, depending upon the context. Concept codes may lend themselves to lumping because they transcend the particular to capture a more abstract idea. Concept codes may surface through first cycle coding or through reviewing a collection of initial codes. Emotion coding can include emotions expressed by the participant or inferred by the researcher. Emotion coding may be particularly appropriate for studies that explore participants' experiences, actions, beliefs, worldviews, or life conditions. Emotion coding may be paired with in vivo coding so that emotions in the participant's own words are indicated using quotation marks. Values coding highlights values, attitudes, and beliefs of participants. Values coding can be useful for studies that focus on identity, cultural values, and experiences. This was a brief description of some types of first cycle coding, and I encourage you to refer to the texts to get more information about all the types of first cycle coding you might use with your project. Another topic discussed in the textbook is whether or not the same segment of text can have multiple codes. 
You can simultaneously code the same segment of text to two different codes, but this should be done sparingly. If I'm coding and I notice that I'm regularly applying the same two codes to segments of text, it is worth revisiting these codes to see if they can be combined or clarified. In Chapter 4, the authors also describe attribute coding. Attributes include elements such as the interview setting or site, participant demographics, and other elements of interest. As part of your InVivo analysis projects, we will explore tools in InVivo for classifying data based on attributes to prepare for queries and conducting advanced analysis. As you develop your codes, beware of viral coding. The qualitative data analysis with InVivo textbook points out that new researchers are often tempted to create duplicative codes to compare attributes. For example, they might create codes for different aspects of the project with yes-no or positive-negative as subcodes. This is problematic because as the subcodes keep repeating themselves, they create an unmanageable data set which does not lend itself to seeing relationships or patterns for developing advanced analysis. To prevent a viral coding system, they encourage two practices. First, each category or concept should only appear once in the coding system. And second, attributes of the whole item, such as a role or location of a participant, should be kept separate from ideas emerging in the data. When it comes to naming codes, consider not only what is in the text, but why the information is interesting for you. What made this jump off the page? Remember, you can always go back and change the names of codes later. The Miles Huberman and Saldana text has a great section that focuses on developing trustworthiness in qualitative data analysis. One way to enhance the trustworthiness of your study during the coding process is to describe and define the codes you create. This can be as easy as having a sheet of paper next to you while you're coding, where you write down the name of the code and a description. This can later become a codebook, which can be a tool to share with people you are collaborating with on qualitative projects. Having a clear description for each code helps you apply the code consistently over time, which can be especially helpful if there's a gap between coding sessions. Having clear descriptions also helps create an audit trail for your project. After you've completed first cycle coding, it is worth revisiting your codes to see if they need any changes. You may find a code with a lot of information that could be broken into smaller buckets. Or you may find codes that have almost nothing coded to them and you realize that they can be combined with other codes or deleted from the project. In second cycle coding, you will also revisit your first cycle codes to look for patterns. Pattern coding allows you to look for relationships, concepts, explanations, and broader categories. When you are coding, it can be tempting to look at the number of references to a particular code, but it is important not to quantify the qualitative by assuming that codes with more references are more significant. Instead, go back to read the text you've assigned to each code and consider the relationship between that text and other aspects of the data that you've coded. Focus on the richness of the data and how this advances your analysis as it relates to your conceptual framework and your research questions. The Miles Huberman and Saldana book identifies tools for advanced analysis, including matrix displays, network displays, graphics, or narrative descriptions, which can aid in clustering first cycle codes and seeing patterns as part of second cycle coding. Throughout the process of coding, it is critical to note what you are doing and why you are doing it through memos and jottings. Jottings are quick thoughts. When hand coding, this could be the equivalent of writing something on a sticky note in Microsoft Word inserting a comment, and in Invivo making an annotation. Jottings capture fleeting or emerging reflections, such as personal reactions, doubts, mental notes, reminders to find additional information, cross-references, or questions to consider. The text describes jottings as breadcrumbs or a trail for expanded memoing. Memos are described in more detail in the Weeks 3 and 4 module for EDF 6479. Memos are researcher reflections and emerging thoughts. They go beyond quick notes to more expanded analysis. They become part of the data. Page 88 in the fourth edition of the Miles Huberman and Saldana text provides ideas for developing analytic memos. When you are writing a memo, don't worry about how it sounds and don't worry about having perfect grammar. As the idea strikes, stop what you're doing and get your thoughts down. This is an important aspect of advanced analysis and moving from data collection and coding to seeing relationships among ideas that speak to your research questions.
This video focuses on the overall process of coding as part of data condensation and introduces some of the analytic decisions that researchers must make, as well as ways to document those decisions to develop the trustworthiness of the project. Coding can be intimidating for new researchers. People often tell me that they are worried about coding because they don't want to get it wrong. But coding is also an exciting opportunity to learn about yourself as a research instrument and to make meaning of your data. As you move through this process, be sure to document your analytic decisions through jottings and memos, seek feedback from colleagues, and enjoy the opportunity to explore your data and to learn and contribute to a body of knowledge. If you have questions, please email me at jvwhite at fsu.edu. Thank you for watching this video and best wishes as you begin your qualitative journey.